Hello and welcome to Malmesbury in England's Silicon Valley. We've taken performance people on the road and landed at Dyson's UK base to speak to its founder, Sir James, and his business partner and son, Jake. Sir James Dyson is one of Britain's most successful businessmen, reimagining such household products as the hairdryer and the vacuum cleaner. Alongside Sir James is his business partner and his design engineer, Jake, who's followed dad into the family business. These two are performance people who have literally reinvented the wheel. I wasn't thinking of making money. I just wanted to make a better vacuum cleaner. I'm not that scared. I mean, I'm still learning a lot and always will learn. Um, and, you know, everyone's been really supportive uh, in, in me being here um, and involving me in all the executive decisions. And I've started to, I hope, have a bit of a strategic input myself. You know, we indulge in things that a, a public company wouldn't, like architecture, like the university, the farms we do. We can do things that we want to do because we think they're the right thing to do. We don't have to worry about whether they're particularly profitable. Firstly, thank you both so much for, for joining us for the podcast. I'm going to start with a little story. So last night we stayed in a local hotel, and I'm, I'm not going to mention the hotel because that wouldn't really be fair, but they were just about to go for a refurb. So I went in the gym this morning, a nice little workout, came out, and there were no, came out of the shower and no towels. So, you know, how am I going to sort this one out? And then I noticed there were some hair dryers in the corner, and this is not a setup. Started uh, trying to dry myself off, and then actually, oh, I can double up with the hair dryers here. Then I realized they were your hair dryers, and I thought, this is ridiculous. We're just about to interview you guys, and here I am drying myself down with the Dyson hair dryer. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they work, which is, uh, of course, they work. But the thing that also occurred to me, and I was generous with George, is just how much you're in people's everyday lives with all of the products that you have and how amazing, you know, that is, that journey. So, uh, you know. With or without good, towels. Good way to open it With up. or without <laughs> towels, yeah. Well, I started off making high-speed landing craft which are only really used by the military and construction companies and oil companies. And I really wanted to do something for the home. So the, first of all, the ball bearer and then the vacuum cleaner is something that everybody uses every day. And it's, it's much more fun doing those products because we're users of hair dryers and vacuum cleaners. So we understand, you know, if we can do something really different, uh, we understand whether it's going to work or not, or we think we know it's going to work or not. But if you're designing a wheelchair or something that you don't actually use, you can't make a decision. You have to ask other people. So I'm, I think we're all much happier designing and developing products we use ourselves. What I want to know from Jake is, how often did you see your father use a vacuum cleaner before he designed one? I just remember you... Just be careful before you ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't actually... Um, the first visibility I've had of a vacuum cleaner was actually, you know, Dad interrogating them. Um, there was this round sort of spaceship, brown and cream hoover uh, device that sort of dragged along the floor. Um, but... Uh, and so I don't actually remember seeing vacuum cleaners being pushed around the house. I just remember seeing that object and cardboard models and vacuum cleaners being ripped to pieces. See, when I think of an inventor, in my head, what comes to me instantly is that scene in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I don't know if I can take you back there, but when mm -hmm. the father, Dick Van Dyke, and the grandfather's there, and the children are sat at the breakfast table, and they're waiting for their breakfast to be delivered via that incredible contraption that yeah. in, in, mm -hmm. in various different forms delivers Heath sausages, cooked, bacon, cooked, exactly. Yeah. And it's what? magical for me. I remember that mm -hmm. and just think, oh, that just must be fascinating, or it must be amazing to have lived, you know, alongside mm -hmm. somebody that's done that sort of thing. I mean, d what, what was life like growing up with Dad, who was constantly immersed in these different problem-solving inventions? Well, it, I mean, there was the, the ball barrow, um, and so I remember being pushed around the garden and there being swings, <laughs> ropes from the trees with orange balls. So you're trying to use every part you could um, for various different things. Uh, so and I remember, you know, boat trolleys being made from it. Um, and I remember the machines at the age of five, you know, being sick from school and hanging out there in the office uh, with Dad and, and, and smelling the, the, the uh, Max Packs, a sort of hot chocolate machine, um, and, and, and smelling the plastic, soapy plastic, where, where the plastic was moulded in, in that factory. And the garage 
across the driveway full of orange bulls. Um, but, uh, um, but I also remember, you know, moving forward from that in the coach house in Bath, where the vacuum cleaning business started, seeing many more contraptions. Um, and you also had a, a studio behind the Royal Crescent in Bath, where they were attempting to invent a new wheelchair. So I remember sitting on wheelchairs, electric wheelchairs, maneuvering around <laughs> in, 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 in the studio. I remember going to Pool Harbour, where you were testing a huge wheel for a landing craft, which is really, really exciting. Um, rides on sea trucks. Um, so I was really exposed because it was never too far away. And, and finally, the, the coach house where the, the vacuum cleaner started, uh, there was a range of things from potato peelers to, uh, to um, you know, landing craft, um, all sorts of ideas coming out. Uh, and models being made, and you know, theory being done. Um, so I was, I was, I suppose, exposed to an awful lot of experimentation. Um, and then, obviously, the vacuum cleaner was the longest experiment of all. <laughs> the only thing was that um, I never taught Jacob to use a lathe and a mill, but he instinctively went and used it. I discovered him using it one day. So he'd obviously been watching people and had the confidence to use it without being taught. It's interesting is, that, isn't it? I was going to ask you about what you thought your influence was on Jake during that time. Because like you said, if you grow up around that, it's sort of you're constantly absorbing it, aren't you? Whether you're aware mm. of it or not. And that must have happened. By, by osmosis. Yeah. But it, it led him to a lot of trouble because the school never believed that his design and technology <laughs> projects were his own. <laughs> yeah, right. and, and indeed, I think that even at university that occurred. But they absolutely were always his ideas. He wouldn't dream of asking me. Probably on purpose, didn't Yeah, yes, he'd, uh, he wanted to do it himself. He wanted it to be his, his own idea. He, ne he never asked me any advice or anything. He did it entirely on his own, which is great. And even but, later with your lighting business, did you? Did yeah, you I mean, ever say to I, Dad, I'm struggling with this or I need a little help on that? Or was no, it absolutely... No, no, no he's never I done that. He's he's never done any help at all. No. Um, he's far too busy. But, uh, <laughs> he's never asked for any money either. No, he's, 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 he's done it Box entirely tick. on his own. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I actually, what I did see was, was Dad with... Two, you know, two model makers and two engineers, you know, and what they achieved over a period of time is extraordinary. And and you know, having those basic tools in those days, you didn't have CAD, which you know, mod, you know, created plastic models of what you're designing very very accurately. It was all done by paper and pencil, uh, and the ability to see things in two D, but in three D product. And to be able to hit such precise dimensions and to manufacture something with that performance and quality is astonishing. Um, and it took years, but it was watching, you know, that small team and the belief of all of them, especially Dad, um, and that uh, making it happen, you know, we can do this uh, and, and we're not going to stop until we do it. Um, and we're going to make it the best machine on the market. And watching that drive, uh, and not giving up, and with the resources they had, was extraordinary. Um, and so I guess I saw that firsthand. I was actually helping build models in summer holidays uh, in the prototypes of the machines. Um, and it, it made me realize that, you know, anything was possible. Uh, but it also made me realize how hard you've got to work and you, you just don't give up. And that, that's what I saw. Quite interesting that you mention about the money side of things as well, because I wonder whether when there is a budget constraint, it makes you more inventive. It, it, you have to be more ingenious about how you approach a problem. Would that be accurate? Yeah, when you haven't got any money, you find a way around it. Mm. You can make it happen. You don't need, well, you need a little bit of money. You don't need much money. Um, I mean, to start with, I had no machines. I had to do everything by hand because I didn't have any money. It's only later that I was able to afford a lathe and proper machinery. You can adapt very easily. Yeah, and, the, and what you said there about perseverance as well and just resilience, it, it strikes me that that is the same across anybody that's in a high-performance role, whatever they might be doing. It's, there are yeah. common traits, aren't there, of performance people? Yeah, it takes a long time. I and mean, the British don't like plodders, but we have to do a lot of plodding. And it's because in, in development, you, you don't think of the solution and build it and that's it. You have to develop iteratively. In other words, you make one change at a time to your prototype. Because if you make two changes, you don't know which made the difference. 
So it's a very um, plodding process, painstaking process, which takes a long time. It can take years. Um, but, and in the end, it looks like a flash of brilliance, but it, which is what the British love. But the British don't admire perseverance and what does sticking that, with something. What does that feel like? Like you said, there aren't any shortcuts, but for both of you, I guess, when you've actually found that solution, whatever it might be, how does that feel? Uh, disappointment. <laughs> really? but, but for, for all sorts of reasons, um, mainly because but, but that's done, so that's not a problem I'm bothered with too much. I'm, I'm on to the next one. Yeah. But, but so you, you don't stop and have a glass of champagne, you're straight on to the next one. Yeah. That you're right, sounds you're right. familiar. You know how you got there, <laughs> so you don't cover old ground, yeah. and, and you know how to make something better. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good start for the next one. But going back to resourcefulness, I mean, um, I remember Dad building a, a vacuum forming machine um, because they, they, you know, they were so rare and cost a fortune. So we actually built one which is lethal. You know, it had uh, you know radiative uh, coils, you know, and high in, high electricity, and uh, you you put sheets of plastic over it to heat up, and then you suction to pull it over a form. It's when he was trying to create the perfect cone. I did it um, in, the, in the basement of our house because that was it. I needed 50 amp supply. It must have been mildly so, terrifying so for everyone it, it in the was, house. I was absolutely leaving. I had to wire it in before cuts. the house supply where the direct mains came in. And I think <laughs> I didn't even pay for the electricity for it because I bypassed the meter. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was amazing. And, and, and he was down there for months trying to get that perfect cone. See, um, that's back to our Chitty Chitty Bang Bang reference. Yeah. Mm. You yeah. remember those moments. And what about the times when it just was Because I suppose the times where it doesn't work outweigh by a country mile the times mm. when it does work. So what about personality as well and sort of, you know, actually sort of parking it for a moment and getting on with family life or actually, like you've said previously, sort of enjoying the moments where you've been able to be mm. successful? Ours is a life of failure. <laughs> I mean, every, every day, you know, you, you have thousands of failures. Uh, in order to get the one success. Uh, it's, it's a pilgrim's progress to get there. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, failures are actually more interesting than successes. You learn from failures, but successes, well, that's done, and you don't question it. Whereas a failure, you question, and you learn from it. Where did you learn that? Did you learn that as a child growing up? I mean, I know education's hugely important to you. Is that something that you you sort of accrued over the years? Or well, is no, it no, it's the opposite. It's the trouble is, you see, it's the opposite. School tells you you've got to get the right answer yes. straight away. So you're, you're learning the wrong thing at school. And what, what's really important in life is learning from failure. So I've always thought schools should mark the other way around. Those children who fail and who try several things before getting it right are the ones who are really learning through viscerally experiencing it. But unfortunately, the education system set up the other way. There was a time in maths where I think we were actually awarded for working out as opposed to the end answer. And I think that's the only way I managed to pass GCSE maths. My working out had mm. some logical conclusion to it. The answer just wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is our but, education system a little bit broken? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it is by concentrating purely on learning by rote. We're missing out on what education, which is two Latin words, educo, you know, leading people out. You're not teaching them to think, to make mistakes and learn from it. And that's what life is about once you get out of university. It's about, um, you know, you don't get things right. Uh, and we should experiment and try to do something new. And the moment you start doing that, you're going to have lots and lots of failures before you make it work. But education doesn't, unfortunately, doesn't teach you that. I mean, there are jobs where you have to be able to learn things by rote. Law is probably one of them. But for most of us, we've got to create things. We've got but to make something new. But also, it's the, you know, it's the subject and the success of it. I mean, understanding people and reading people is what makes people, you know, successful and achieve great things in this world. No one teaches that. And it all hinges on one exam, you know. And, uh, you know, life doesn't work like that. So I think the way they structure and, and, um, uh, and accredit people uh, in, in performance is completely wrong as well. And, and, and people are misunderstood right from the onset because they're looking at grades and exam results and it doesn't represent them at all. I suppose I mean, that's... Actually, sport teaches you yes. more at school. Yeah. I think I learnt much more from sport than mm. academic academic work because you 
you know, you've got to experiment. You've got to learn to work with people. You've got to learn to beat people. And you will competition. Fail. Competition is really important in life, and people won't talk about it now. No, but it drives you. They're the people you've got to beat, and it drives improvement. It ups your performance. But it, competition's a dirty word. Yeah. And and to focus on something you enjoy, because ultimately you're going to be addicted and work extremely hard at something you enjoy. And, and you know, finding that out at school should be the, the priority. I mean, Dad was skipping into work every single morning um, mm. and had always had a smile on his face because he loved what he was doing. Um, and I understand that too. I was only good at creative subjects, so I really enjoy what I do. Um, so it, 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 it just made, it helps you drive harder at it. I think your, your mum and your wife, your lovely wife, dear, just said that you, your, your ambition is always to um, make enough money to pay for the next thing. And that was something mm. she said. But can you ever have imagined having a university? I mean, we're sat mm. in the roundhouse now, which is part of the student mm. accommodation here um, at your Dyson headquarters in the UK. I mean, can you imagine of having a university? Oh, of course not. I didn't imagine any of this. Uh, but I, I just did as Jacob says, what I was passionate about. I wasn't thinking of making money. I just wanted to make a better vacuum cleaner. Uh, and it's it sort of built on... I'm a builder, really, as well. That's the other thing. Uh, well, you've been to the house. I mean, I, I enjoy building things. And quite, well, and, you quite literally did all the plumbing and electrics. Yeah. And, and we did actually build one of our houses from couldn't scratch. Afford, couldn't afford a plumber. <laughs> Or an electrician. Did he wire it correctly? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, he did. He did. And plumb it. And plumb it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I suppose unless you do the hands-on bit, how can you, uh, sort of, you're trying to empower other people to do... That's a very good point. Um, our engineers and scientists make their own prototypes. We don't have technicians do it. And it's the act of making it makes you understand it better. And when you then test it, because you've built it, you understand what might be going wrong, because it always goes wrong. Uh, so the, the, the act of using your hands and your brain, I think, is very important and undervalued. I'm not sure you use your hands to help build the America's Cup boat, but on the same level... I've you done do, a bit of grinding you, carbon over the years, but <laughs> there you, you are, do, there you are. You do try and get, don't you? You try and get very involved with the design and the engineering side and developing those cup boats, don't you, from that perspective, because that technology, well, that is a technology race, isn't it? I mean, if you yes, don't have the fastest yes, boat, you won't yeah. win. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and as the end user, the product, yeah, yeah ultimately, yeah. But no, how important to, is it to do yeah. that from and, your perspective? And I think, to, I think, actually, that communication... Is, is another thing that, that's really key. But, I mean, this is just such an incredible facility. And mm. the students, are, as I understand it, they can work for Dyson after they've graduated. And they must work for Dyson. They must work for Dyson. <laughs> they should work for Dyson. <laughs> they should work for Dyson. And, <laughs> and, 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 and they're they free as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, they, they have a job. And actually, what they love to do, and almost all of them immediately went abroad to Japan or to our companies in Japan and Singapore and so on, which is great. I mean, that's exactly something that young people should do, yeah, and before we, they get families and all that sort of thing. But surely we need more facilities like this in the, in the UK with this sort of shortfall of engineering that we have. I, I know in our team with the America's Cup, we're crying out to try and find, you know, good controls engineers, system engineers, but there's a massive shortfall. I mean. Huge shortfall. Yeah. I think it's going to be two million engineers short in two years' time. Now, it's a real, real problem. And we've tried for years through our work with schools, with a design technology program to interest, to make design and technology an exciting subject. But the government's done its best to get rid of the course from schools because it's not as important as academic subjects, they think. And it's an expensive subject to teach. So... Girls are not taking it now, and fewer and fewer boys are taking it. And what, what, what's extraordinary is the contribution as well, so quickly. You know, it can be towards the end of the first year of the university, and they're already inventing things that are yeah. being patented. Um, and you're empowering them to do that, presumably, yeah. because you mm. absolutely want to create that culture. And they're working on live projects yeah. with teams of engineers and very, very complex. Um, projects as well. But the other thing I think is really interesting is that, you know, when they graduate, some of them want to go into other areas of the business, such as commercial or marketing. And um, 
as, as we all know, to have a broad experience of all those disciplines of a company makes you, uh, you know, a very rounded business person, a very astute business person later on in this company. If you've had experience of all those other elements around the business, as well as being a brilliant engineer. So, so that's quite exciting to see. And you sort of did that by going away in order to come back, because after university you came to be here, to work yeah. here, and then you thought, actually, I'm too, was it too claustrophobic, or you described it as being in a bit of a shoebox, and you just wanted <laughs> to get out and do and do your own thing, and then in order to come back. I, I started off doing a few interior projects in London, and then um, I actually started to find it a bit boring, because it wasn't dealing with a thousandth of a millimetre, it was you know, a couple of inches spare in there. Um, and so I came back here for, I think, two years, two and a half years, and worked on an extremely exciting project, which didn't come to market, but was very ambitious. And I had sort of exposure of, you know, an idea to almost a manufactured solution uh, throughout those two and a half years, which gave me complete visibility of that process. Um, and yeah, I did feel that I'd moved back home um, I was stuck in a shoebox, I called it. Um, and it wasn't only um, that that made me want to sort of get out into the big world and try things myself. It was also, going back to failure, the, the sort of failure of exam results at school. And it was all about proving to myself that I could do this um, and do something on my own um, and set myself a challenge. Um, and so I, I got a little garage in, on a roundabout in Wandsworth with a mill and a lathe and spent three years working on a sort of counter-rotating ceiling fan. It was like a Chinook helicopter um, that oscillated around the ceiling. It was very efficient in mixing the air up. It's like two tornadoes in your room. But it was also very complex. Um, and I met up with a, a I call him a professor, he had sort of 60s glasses on and was responsible for one of the first electronic washing machines doing the electronics and the Flymo. So the Flymo had a very similar torque reaction with the way it sweeps from one side because of the blade underneath. And he was in his late 60s and he used to come down from Derbyshire for three days and he was like a, a mentor for three days a week with me in my workshop helping me develop this. Um, and there was another man as well who used to machine all the jet engines for Rolls-Royce. Um, and he actually slept in my workshop. <laughs> and his, his pillowcase was a can of ten and super. Uh, and his underpants were hanging out on, <laughs> on the rafters. Um, and, but yeah, he did actually live in there. And it was like the elves and the shoemakers. Yeah. I'd do a CAD drawing and one day, I, the next morning I'd come back and there'd be this gleaming perfectly machined component on the side. And he taught me how to use all these machines. And through that, I understood the limits of materials, what you can and can't make on these machines. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of the products that I did were all sort of machined metal and very sort of mechanical and engineered because they came off those machines. But those two people inspired me hugely. And maybe the person I am taught me a huge amount and the skills to, to be able to develop and make a, a working product that can be manufactured. And then I learned everything else by going out to sell it, by trying to market it myself, by going to Asia to see how all the manufacturing is done. And probably by doing something on my own like that, learned a lot more than maybe an engineer that's working on a drive system for three or four years. They become an expert one thing, not a generalist and potentially experiencing a lot of other things that I think really helps you, uh, particularly when it's you're trying to make a business thing, out isn't it? it. Yeah. Seeing the bigger picture as well. Yeah. Do, yeah. You in, do you enjoy that entrepreneurial side of it, though? Like you say, it's not just the engineering and the design, it's the whole piece, which, mm. James, you've really, mm. you know, together as a family, you yeah. built this. But, I mean, that, that's exciting, I, I imagine, being entrepreneurs. I think marketing it is quite exciting. Right. Thinking about how you're going to sell it and sell excite it. people with it and ideas there creatively. Actually selling it was, I was very bad at because you're so passionate about it that, you know, <laughs> design <laughs> you retailers... you take yourself back to the customer. 
I saw the only salesman I had that was brilliant at it told them that they needed it, not that we needed them. <laughs> and um, when you're obsessed and passionate about a product, you know, it almost puts them off. Yeah. Um, so I, had, I, I didn't enjoy selling it, and I didn't do very well at it, but when a good person dealt with it, they, the products did really well. Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Have you had that experience as well, James, where you're madly passionate about something that you've created? You, you know, you have such an emotional connection with it, trying to get somebody else to see it from that perspective and trying to... Oh, yeah. That first sale, basically. The, the most boring person is an inventor because <laughs> he's far too tied up in himself and his invention. So you've got to step back from it and, and, and be very simple about it. I mean, I... Um, all... I mean, I didn't know how to sell anything. So all, all we did at the beginning was talk about the engineering, the technology in the product. And vacuum cleaner, we didn't even talk about the technology in our vacuum cleaner. We just said what was wrong, why I invented it, what was wrong with the old technology. So the thing is to keep it, keep it very simple. But how did you get people over the line? Because you're doing something that's different to what they're used to seeing in everyday life, and you're saying that this is better. So how do you mm. get them to effectively take their own risk on you and that product? And there, there was that story, I remember you said, one of the wholesalers, and they said, Dyson vacuum, zero bags. Yes. Well, no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting no those line is, is really interesting. I mean, the thing is that the, on the whole, retailers, when they see a new product, don't like it because they don't know that they it's can different. sell it. Yeah. And even our own salespeople are worried about new products because they don't know that they can sell it. They know they can sell the old one, but they don't know about the new one. But I mean, what I discovered, particularly with the ball bearer, um, which I did before the vacuum cleaner, was that um, if people see something different, they think about it, and actually they're excited by it. Not everybody, but some people. And the moment you've got some enthusiasts, people who are prepared to take a risk buying it and being interested in it, then if it's a good product, then it snowballs. Obviously, it was a bad product. It doesn't, but if it's a good product, it snowballs. So, when do you remember clearly that sort of conversation, that first conversation where you thought, "We're off. We're off and running here." Because it's one thing to make it, isn't it? And then it's another thing to yes. get the buy-in from other people. Well, well, getting it into an outlet is really important. I mean, whether it, I mean now you can sell it on the web, and that's it's much easier. But when I started, you had to go through retailers yeah. and mail order catalogs. And the interesting thing is, well, that the, the a mail order catalog was the first outlet to take it. Um, and that, what, one of the things there is that they can put, instead of being £199, which is what we were selling it at, which was three times the price of a normal vacuum cleaner, it was £1.99 per week. <laughs> yes. So there was a huge, it, it didn't a appear so difference. bad. Yeah. bad. But I remember the, and I think I can talk about it freely now, but the, the buyer for this catalog said, why should we put in a Dyson vacuum cleaner taking out space in our catalogue rather than a Hoover and Electrolux, which we know sells? And this was, I'd been with him about seven hours in his office by this point. And I said, well, because your catalogue's boring. <laughs> and, and that, there's the, you know, <laughs> retail, well. retail. This could go one of two <laughs> ways. Yeah, we could have gone one of two ways. I was quite <laughs> desperate at that point. And the point, the point is that people want excitement when mm. they go shopping. Even if they don't buy it, to see something that's different and not the run-of-the-mill thing. Yeah. Uh, so in one sense, it's hard. In the other sense, it's, it's good because you're showing people, you're exciting people. It's something different, even if they reject it. And how difficult is it to justify that higher price point? Because if you are offering, like you say, um, mm. something that is three times the value of something else on the market, how do you, how do you sell that in with confidence as a, as a first-time use to somebody? Well, we never have any confidence because you've got no idea. So you're, you're, it's, it's a gamble. Um, but you have to make it three times better. I mean, not literally three times better, but a lot better so that people really want it. But there, there's an and element... And last longer and have the values in it that people want. The, you know, now, now it's about sustainability. It's a sustain, mm. sustainability and performance. If it has those things in it, people, I think, will pay more. It's a life full of risk, isn't it? Being an yes. inventor. Yes, yeah, and being a manufacturer. Mm. Uh, uh, is, I do yes. think the technologies have magic around them, though. Mm. The, 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 you, you can see it, and it's visible on the form of the product. Uh, and I think that the combination of, 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 you know, feeling that performance with that magic is, is quite special. So I, yeah. 
I think I think that there's a hook to it as well, and an excitement that make people want to buy the products. I think we're, that's we're, really we're, we're definitely massive fans <laughs> in our household. But there's one. No, but you're, I, you're, I think this is coming to back, me, to, this coming back to the risk yeah. point, which, yeah. is, which is really interesting. I mean, we're, we have to think a long way ahead. Developing technology with something like electric motors, for example, took 15 years to get to the market. But now, once we got them there, they revolutionized the vacuum cleaner. Instead of being a 2,000 watt vacuum cleaner, it's a 200 watt vacuum cleaner. It's very light and, much, and works, it's much more efficient. Um, but it, you know, that, that's 15 years of investment. And then you have to invest in production lines to make the electric motor, uh, which are hundreds of millions. And then you have to invest in the tooling for the product that goes with it. So when you bring that thing to the market, you've invested hundreds of millions in 15 years and is it going to sell? Are people going to buy this different type of stick vacuum cleaner? And, uh, you know, they didn't actually instantly buy it. It was quite a slow takeoff. But now it's completely dominates the market. There's a couple of things going on there because you're living in one world and you're developing for another. And that's full of risk because you don't know sort of you're ahead of your time, but you mm. don't also know in the process of whether that's going to be right for that moment in 10 years. I mean, mm. as I say, like full of risk. Your point though, Jake, that you make about um, the magic of the thing, I think that's really interesting because whenever I hear people talk about Dyson products um, and whenever I read anything about them as well, soul, magic, excitement, you know, all of these emotive words come about, which are not normally associated with a household product. It just isn't something that you normally align that with. Um, and certainly from my perspective, I was saying to Ben, because we, we've got a startup business at the moment, and we're talking about being in people's lives and people wanting to put us on the shelf as opposed to hide us in a larder cupboard. And I feel that way about a Dyson product. You have it out. You don't. You're not shaming it into a cupboard. You have it out, and you don't well, apologise for that. You're one of their best customers. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, very pleased to hear. As it, my straight it. hair can show you. <laughs> Now, but it's true, isn't it? There is this sort of emo right. emotional connection to the product. And it's going to be very interesting now that we're starting to do wearables and we're yeah. launching the first purifying headset this year, um, and it'll be the first product that's worn outside. Um, rather than inside someone's home that you discover when you go around for a dinner party or a cup of tea. Um, so it's going to be very interesting, the reaction. Um, and, and Is that ahead of its time? I mean, yeah. we've obviously got mm. to a place now where we're much more aware of why that might be needed and required post a pandemic. Yeah, it's um, very ahead of its time. Um, and it's very important to, to make people aware of the pollution and the fact we've got a, a solution um, that prevents you uh, from suffering, um, from breathing in all these pollutants out, out in cities and on the street and, and in transport. Which brings us on to that working from home thing. You've been pretty vocal about this lately. Um, we're, we're just launching a startup and trying to hire people that are prepared to come in more than two days a, a week is actually really hard to do. I mean, how, how do you sort of overcome that, do you think? And how important is it that the government rally behind this productivity piece, which doesn't seem to exist post-COVID, which it really should? Yeah, well, we know that people are not as productive at home. But even more than that, they're not learning no. We all come to work every day to learn, and that's vital in order to improve and develop new ideas and to, to do things better. Um, and working at home, you can't do that. And I think and there are often mental issues with people working at home as well. You know, we're, we're social animals. We need to interact with people. And I also think it's nice to have a difference between where you work and where you live. It sort of makes you value where you live more, mm. even if you hate going to work. Uh, so... But, but more than that, um, you know, we're, we're a collective working together to achieve something. If you've got people scattered about at home, A, you don't know what they're doing, and B, they're not part of the thrill, the enterprise, the excitement of it all. Yeah. The, the ideas come the ideas. up in conversation and Around in, the in a forum machine. that you can't have on a Teams or, or Zoom meeting. Um, you know, they're just spare of the moment and, and spontaneous. Uh, and, and also, the, you know, there's fundamental um, confidentiality uh, issues. Um, you know, we have such strict security here uh, and, and the way we work and the research centres um, because it's, you know, the, com the competitive landscape we're in is, is colossal. 
be, and, be, and you're be. able to do that as well because you're a family business and you can push innovation the way you wish to do it, right? Yeah, and, and we're, yeah, we're able to invest in technologies that they probably wouldn't do because they're under pressure for different reasons from yeah. board of directors or shareholders. Mm. The, the, I'm mm. glad you raised the family business thing because that is interesting. Um, you know, we indulge in things that a, a public company wouldn't, like architecture, like the university, the farms we do. We can do things that we want to do because we think they're the right thing to do. We don't have to worry about whether they're particularly profitable or whether they cost more because we want to do them because we like those sort of values. Uh, and we can think very long term, as Jake says. And the, the values and our aims and what we want to do can remain for generations rather than it relying on the next CEO to decide what the company does. So the company can drastically change if you're a public company if you get a new CEO. Whereas with a family business, the values that we start off with and what we're trying to do remains pretty constant. And, and is that, does that, the fact that it's a family business, does that really stem from that very early experience with the bull barrow and feeling that other people were involved in that process and that was quite painful to go through and therefore it was very important moving forward to maintain the integrity and authenticity of what you were doing? Exactly that, you said it all. Yes, I, mean, I wanted to own 100% of it so that whether it, it succeeded or not was down to me and then all the decisions were mine and all the decisions are now ours uh, as a family. All the major decisions are taken by the whole family um, and not an outside person who has a particular interest which might be different to ours. It's, it's, it's interesting how many you know, businesses out there have fallen asleep at the wheel and not invested 10 years ahead and not sort of taken risks to forecast what they think the world might be like in 50, 15 years' time, stop preparing for it. Um, and, you know, companies like ours die very quickly if you don't do that. And if you don't diversify in different technologies to balance it. Um, so it's actually really, really important to, to diversify um, and extremely important to start planting and, you know, plotting where you're going uh, a long way into the future as well, rather than just thinking about tomorrow's buck. Yeah. How are those... Well, we're not just doing it on our own. I mean, we have very good non-executive directors. So in that sense, we're a bit like a public company and they add hugely, huge value. Mm -hmm. And each, and the people working here are wonderful. Uh, the senior leaders, everybody is wonderful. But the senior leaders direct the company as well as us. I mean, they, it changes all the time and they're part of that change. But we're here as the constant, which yeah. is important. And how, how have those values changed from right back to the beginning, I mean, you mentioned sustainability and, and people's health and well-being, you know, on the back of a pandemic and so on. The sustainability and, was hardwired in from the beginning right. because an engineer wants to use the least amount of energy the least, and the fewest materials. So we've always been like that. You know, we got rid of the bag. Bags are these plastic things that, that are non-biodegradable and you have to keep buying them. So the first thing we did was to get rid of that. And then we use less power, and now we use a tenth of the power. So we're not driven, we're not Johnny come late list to the green movement. We were doing it right from the beginning, because that's what engineers are like. Yeah. And what, yeah. And what so the second part of that is, what's, what is the vision for the future? Where do you both see the technology being, you know, 10, 20 years' time? Well, Jake's the one who will be driving it, so he'd better Jake, answer yeah. that <laughs> <one>. <laughs> well, I think up until now, um, our products have been, had huge advantages mechanically. So their performance are driven through mechanics. Um, and as we're moving forward, the development of, you know, semiconductors, sensors, vision systems, which we've invested heavily in, um, and combined with high-speed digital motors. And your ability to sense things and control things through sensors and for products to feed information to other products to create a sort of ecosystem means that the functional advantages in the product are not necessarily a mechanical solution anymore. Uh, they're clever sensing devices that inform consumers and create an advantage in function to a consumer and also uh, allow us to have sort of feedback to improve on products. So I think moving forward, um, more autonomy and more uh, the, the products being able to perform 
advantage, advantageous tasks and benefit to users goes beyond mechanical solutions. Um, and, you know, connectivity... What does, that, what does that mean? Break that down for me. I'm trying to follow. What does that mean? Well, that, um, you know, if, if you're able to sense environments, it'll inform you of, you know, potentially what your hair has been through during the day. And we understand a huge amount of hair and we put those pieces of information together. It could give us some interesting direction. Um, but also, the, it's not just the products, it's the way the business operates. And to be competitive, you've got to be extremely efficient there too. Um, so the ability to monitor our products out there on the market, to know when there's a fault, and to be able to fix that fault before the consumer sees it, or to inform the consumer so they're aware of it before it goes wrong. And we then know how to deal with it, whether it's cost-effective to send the new one, whether to retrieve it and fix it. Um, so it's and, like a software update, effectively. Yeah, well, that, that will improve its performance. Yeah. But in order to, I mean, in a world where they bought it, but we manage it, and it can all be done autonomously by connectivity. So the, the customer service, the, the reliability, the, the sort of, um, the retention to consumers to believe in our, the quality of our products and be able to manage all of that by, by monitoring the machines as they're being used on a daily basis, plus be able to have a far accurate understanding of how people are using our machines to have designed more specifically for them um, will give us much better direction and produce much better products. Do you do what Dad did growing up and tinker around the whole time? Do your girls see you doing this or, or is it very much more a different level now? you have this? Well, actually, I did see Dad quite a lot when I was a child. He was very attentive, played cricket with me in the garden, came to watch sports matches. I mean, I remember him going away for lengthy periods of time to Japan, for example, and every time he did, something would go wrong, like ceilings would come down <laughs> in the house. And, and I've actually... Good time to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Plan yeah. And the same things happened to me, ironically, um, where things like that have happened while I'm away. And um, I do did spend a lot of time in Asia when my kids were sort of two and three, which I regret. Um, but, you know, you have to do that. You need to go out there and, and oversee things that, you know, when you're manufacturing something. Um, but, uh, and they've been to my studios. Um, they've, you know, we try and bring our kids into the, the business here to see all the new products and they get really excited about it. And what's really interesting is we see them do things with the products and get excited about things that give us more confidence um, in exciting younger people with our products. They're our future customers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talk a lot, though, about how technology can have a negative effect sometimes on mental well-being, especially children. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us as parents of young children, we've got a six-year-old and a two-year-old, even the two-year-old now, I say two, I've got his age wrong, he's actually 19 months old. Mm. <laughs> but even he now swipes on an iPad. Oh, you think, how I, did this happen? I can't so, bear it. So what mm. bit of that do we not let sort of completely take over our, our children's lives and make sure that, you said it before, James, that being out in the outdoors and doing mm. sport and being in that environment is mm. so good for your head as well as your physical yeah. being. You know, I think... Devices speeding up productivity, that's just internet searching, mail, and communication's fine, but it's all the other stuff that's not. Um, and, you know, watching creative children turn into zombies is just heartbreaking. Actually, I've just worked out how to make mine turn off after three hours every day. Um, so, that, so there's no discussion. <laughs> yeah, so there's no discussion anymore. Yeah. I don't even have to have a debate. It just happens. Put a smaller um, battery in there yeah. and hide the charges. <laughs> but it is interesting that you, we don't know how. It would make it very difficult for you to actually work that one out. Yeah. And on another a, problem to solve. <laughs> yeah. Taking that to another level in terms of, you know, computers, machine learning, AI, you know, does, do you think society potentially there's a danger of computers taking over our lives to an extreme level? Or is that just sort of sci-fi nonsense? That, no, I, th yeah. I think they will. They yeah. will. But uh, I, I'm not sure that the things they're going to take over are things that you, act you actually want to do, you and I actually want to do. It'll do a lot of the thinking that we should be doing that we're not doing. 
but and, and maybe frees us up to do more creative things. Because I don't think they'll ever be truly creative. Yeah, so the, the, there's some of the extreme theories of, of the computer taking over and, and actually controlling more than, well, than already, we ever they in, already envisioned do. they They would. already do, of yeah. course. I mean, they're, they're, they're monitoring factories, they're monitoring power levels, all sorts of things. That's already happened. Um, but if, if they can be more intelligent and do what's not being done, monitor what's not being monitored, then that's a good thing. Okay. Jake, this is your area, isn't it? The AI and robotics. Um, what can you tell us that you're working on that's um, sort of secret, but something that you won't have to kill us to tell us, if you see what I mean? <laughs> well, we, we already do robotic vacuum cleaners that are pucks. They're sort of, that move around the floor, um, sucking everything that they come across um, and cleaning very, very well. Um, we're now looking at off the floor. Uh, so I have to let your imagination run with that one. But, I mean, the, the, the reason's no different. You know, we're solving problems. And um, as Dad just touched on now, what's really important to people is time. I mean, iPads and the advancement of computers have given people more time or allowed them to do more in that time. Um, and, and that's a very attractive proposition for someone but we're fundamentally solving problems and problems that happen in the home, again. Um, so we're looking uh, very close at robotics, funding a lot of robotics research, which includes vision systems, which we've already got a lot of experience in, um, to be able to perform interesting uh, problem-solving tasks in the home. What's the, what's the biggest problem, as you see it, in the home that's yet to, sol yet to be solved? that you wish you could solve. Oh, well, no, that would be giving it away. But, but, well, but, <laughs> well, we're also... Well, I, we're also I tried. Yeah. I mentioned it on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a recruitment video the, the, the other week. <laughs> okay. Actually, but I, I, I've just raised young children and, God, I'd love someone to clean up after them. <laughs> yeah, tidy, yes. tidy up. And, yes, and can, yes. You know, a char that. charging yeah. leads left lying around and all that sort of thing. Picking up Lego. We're, we're learning how to... We're developing um, strawberry pickers because we, we've got huge strawberry greenhouses. The moment we have to pick them by hand, so we're doing robotic strawberry pickers. And funnily enough, the, the most difficult thing is seeing all the way around the strawberry to see if it's red all the way around. That's one of the most difficult problems. Have you solved it? Uh, well, nearly. But it, also, they're rather slow at the moment. Uh, you know, they sort of look at it and then snip it and put it in the bag, whereas, um, you know, a human is still much quicker. But we'll get there in the end. It feels like with the process of um, innovation and invention, um, there isn't really a, a, a room for regrets. Do you have any, are there any regrets there of things that you've designed over the years and thought, oh, maybe it wasn't the right time for it or, or maybe, you know, there was another opportunity yeah. that I didn't get to explore there? Well, yes, but I mean, you don't worry about that. You get on with the next thing and next thing's exciting. But I mean, the car was a big disappointment. Uh, and for everybody who worked on it for, for the five years that we worked on it, but the the whole commercial situation changed. Uh, that must have been, but that I think is an incredibly brave decision, really, because you put a huge amount of time, effort, money, investment mm. into it. Three hundred engineers to yeah. actually say yeah. this isn't going to work, and yeah, put that, you know, that that's actually incredibly brave. Yes, yeah, and then we spent five hundred million on it, but. Worse than that, really, it was five years with with five hundred people putting yeah. all their. You know, can you their can work. you use them in other ways? Unfortunately, we've used them actually, not the ideas no. in the car, yeah. but a lot that's of fine. them. Most of them came into the do do other things here, which is so that's actually been a huge benefit. Mm. So I think we've got our five hundred million back through yeah. the input of that great talent into the yeah. rest of the business. And Jake, you're now charged with the task, I'm guessing, with taking things forward. I feel like the most monumental responsibility or have you grown up with this all your life and therefore it's just part of who you are and part of the family furniture effectively? Well, I've, I've seen what it, what it takes to do it and I've seen how the company's been built. Um, it is growing, well, has grown at an extremely fast pace since I joined here five years ago. Um, um, I don't... I'm not that scared. I mean, I'm still learning a lot and always will learn. Um, and, you know, everyone's been really supportive 
in in me being here um, and involving me in all the executive decisions. And I've started to, I hope, have a bit of a strategic input myself and sort of understand the the, the direction we're going in and, and what needs to be done to prepare the business for that. Um, and I'm really, really, what the thing that excites me most of all is is that freedom of invention, mm-hmm. is, is, you know, being able to think of anything and everything and, um, and um, many more exciting products we can do and areas we can break into. Um, and everyone who works here has that mentality and everyone who works here knows how long it takes to achieve that. And completely bought into it, although we're trying to speed that up. <laughs> the, the, um, great, the great thing is that Jake went off to start his own business and manufacturing business and learned all the, I don't say he made mistakes, he didn't make that many, but he learned all the whole aspect of it, how you set up a manufacturer, how you, how you market things, how you sell things. So he'd already made mistakes, if you like, and learned how to do it himself before he came here. So he hasn't, he hasn't come here as an apprentice. He came in over the age of 40 as someone who had already achieved great things outside in, in a similar way, you know, learning to develop technology, manufacture it and market it. And that must have been hugely important for you anyway, psychologically and everything else, to have done that and got that and come, and come to this conversation as a, you know, in your own right and your own terms. Yeah, it was a good, good start. But, um, I mean... <laughs> You know, designing the products and having successful products is not all all of it. Having a very efficient and competitive business that operates efficiently and competitively is the second challenge. And and you know, making sure that, that is always at the forefront of, if you like, operational innovation um, will will see as well. I mean, it's a combination of the two that that you need. What are the key characteristics you need for a successful product? Well, it must be better than what went before. It must excite people. It must be well-designed, have great technology that overcomes problems that people want solved, which used to be all about performance, going faster and getting bigger. But now it's very different. It's the, almost the inverse, that people want smaller things, lighter things, more ecological things, using less power, less water, whatever it is. So the, the, the reason the people, and by the way, they want to buy from companies that have the right values or share their values. That's important as well. So it's, it's changing all the time. I think it's exciting, actually. I think the most important thing of all is maintaining the right culture here in the business. It started off as a very exciting, ambitious startup, and now it's a huge, ambitious startup. <laughs> um, and we have to keep that alive and, and that culture to, to keep moving forward and thrive as well. So I think that's another really, really important um, aspiration and, and, and drive. And you feel the magic actually the, of the, the place. The importance of where we're sitting now, looking across at the pods there, having 18-year-olds coming here and, and driving the culture, driving innovation, pe- people without experience, naive people. Naive pe- I like naivety because you question things. And when you're doing something, you're pioneering. Uh, and I've always wanted to recruit graduates, but now I'm recruiting undergraduates, you know, 18-year-olds. And that, that's important for us, because we don't want to do what people have done before. We don't want to live by experience. We want to live by thinking differently, thinking creatively, and even naively. I call it, often call it, wrong thinking. So if you're trying to think of a different way of doing something, if you think of the right way, that's what everybody else thinks of. But if you think of doing it the wrong way, and of course it looks stupid to begin with, but it sets you off on a completely different path. Yeah, seems to have worked all right. <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> quick, quick performance tip from each of you, because this is a performance people podcast, so it's all about how people can improve on a, a daily basis, how they can improve themselves and their lives every day. So Jake, maybe you first. Um, how can people better perform every day? What's a good performance tip from you? Uh, I, I think... You know, be more observant um, of of culture and trends and and the world around you. You know, keep your eyes open. Um, keep your energy levels up, and uh, and you know, do what you enjoy, and and work really hard at it. You know, um, I think I think that that would be my my sort of strongest tips. 
That's as good as any. Mm. James? Well, I would add to that curiosity about how everything works. That's so important. And, um, and come in every day to do something different and to make a difference and achieve something every day. I'm going to take that away with me and put it into practice a on a daily basis. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and hopefully I'll come up with the next brilliant invention. You will, thank I'm you, sure. Both you of will. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It's been really okay, thank thanks you. very much. Thank you. That was a brilliant insight into the world of technology from what I would say is a couple of masters of the industry. But what was your biggest takeaway? Well, other than you telling that story about you having to blow yourself down thought... with a couple of Dyson hair dryers what in the, the gym this of morning. That? I know, that is what you call timing. Um, but, you know, that tells a lot. That tells a lot about the fact they're in our everyday lives with the products that they make. And they're problem solvers, aren't they? That's the thing that really comes through. They are problem solvers um, who are relating things to our everyday worlds and the challenges that we face. Um, and also they're not afraid to make mistakes, which I think is a great lesson for everybody. We should all be given the freedom to make mistakes. Yeah, and I, I think the determination that they've, they've both shown, I think really s struck out to me, you know, in comparing it to the sporting arena. So. Determination is clearly something that they both got in spades and why Dyson is the success that it is today. And patience. Lots and of patience. patience, which I don't have much of. Thank you for watching and or listening. This has been Performance People. We are Ben and Georgie Ainsley. And remember, from what we've learned today, curiosity is a key thing. Question everything. <laughs>